And now we're going to listen to Arcade Bai, who works at Neon Giants, and we're going to hear a little bit about the truth about the games industry. So, a big round of applause. Okay, everything's working. Yep, I can hear myself. Um, thanks for having me, and thanks for being here instead of eating lunch. Uh, I can't see much, but it doesn't look like people brought food. Um, I'll uh, preface this with who I am and what we're doing, but first of all, um, Sweden Game reached out to me and asked me to do a talk, which is, you know, uh, always an honor. And uh, Vanya claimed that the people here and the people on the interwebs are uh, game devs, game dev students, and aspiring game devs. And that they want to see the actual industry. So I chose to focus on what the actual industry has been and still is for me. And um, it, it, it has a happy ending, let's say, but uh, I'm going to try and be tr pretty, pretty truthful. So I'm going to do something that I hope is inspirational, that I su suspect might be soul crushing, but it is undeniably true. So I present the absolute but subjective truth with the career in Chronicles of Arcade Barry, that's me, the career in classic AAA game development industry 2005 to 2021. With that, I can claim everything to be true. So who am I and why should you even listen? I studied in Chavde myself back in 2005 to 2008. I was very fortunate to get a job straight after the studies. I uh, moved into the traditional AAA. I went to Grin, I moved over to Poland, I went to the, the US with Epic, and Machine Games, I worked on games like Bulletstorm, uh, Gears of War. Um, I worked on Fortnite, but as I saw that this is not going anywhere, I left. And then I went on to work on every Wolfenstein and Enough is Enough. So uh, me and a friend started our own studio. So now I'm in a weird triple I, double A, triple A mentality in the thing. But what do I know about careers? Because I want to talk about how to get a job, help you guys get your first job if you don't have one, but also discuss how to treat your job if you want to have a career. So the reason I feel I am allowed to talk about this is because I started as a student, as many people here. Uh, I've gotten plenty of job offers via different methods uh, by applying myself and also via recruiters. I've been headhunted, I've seen hundreds of CVs, and I've been involved in hiring myself for about nine years, and today I actually sign the contracts, so I can with certainty say that at least some people think like this because I do. And again, I'm talking about the traditional AAA, the big studios, the three plus year developments, the more money than you want to think about budgets, and not the cool new indie. I don't understand it, it's awesome, it looks fun, it's not what I'm talking about. And I understand that there are people here that want to pursue the indie dream. That's fantastic. I can't help you. And there are people that want to get into traditional bigger games. Maybe I can help you. So let's start with you before you've even applied for a job. And that is mostly students, but also people, you know, now teaching themselves, being in game jams, but you're not in the industry yet. And I want to talk about what you can do already to basically increase your chances and your odds of getting a job. So basically, there are only two requirements to get a job, um, not including that the job exists. But the first one is that you need to be good enough. And what good enough means can be different things. It can be meeting the criteria, but it is being what the employer is looking for, right? And the only other thing you need to do is be better than the guy next to you. Because you need to understand that if there's one job, only one person will get it. And if it's not you, it's someone else. And if it's someone else, it's not you. And that, I think, is a pretty important 
mentality thing to adjust to. So I'm, I'm mostly here to just kind of set your mind in a certain space, and I don't want this to turn into something very elitist or very competitive, but you need to know what you're getting yourself into, because there are way more people looking for jobs than there are jobs available. Back in my day, um, they said that there were a thousand gaming jobs in total in Sweden, and that was jobs already taken. I don't know how many were actually open, um, but already back then, they were churning out about 300 students from gaming schools every year. The math didn't add up. Today, we have many more studios, which is fantastic. We also have way, way more schools, which you know, is great if you want to study game dev, uh, not necessarily great to increase your chances of getting a job. So the competition is fierce, especially for junior positions. So just beware going into this. I, I'm not suggesting that you stab your friends, but if you, if you have the same dream and you're looking for the same job, you won't both get it. So I think there are basically four, let's call it pillars. Uh, maybe I should have made pillars for the art, but uh, circles them. There are four things you use when you apply for a job, and it is your craft. I'm going to focus in on design because I have a background in design. Today I'm a creative director. We're going to look at experience, which unfortunately a lot of people don't have before they start out. We're going to look at your portfolio, and we're going to look at your charisma and your personality. So starting with the experience, you need to start now. You should have started yesterday. You should try and get experience in any and every way you can. All experience counts, and not just the fun stuff. And you should start using all the tools. Because right now, you can't really get experience working on AAA. You can't get experience starting a game or working towards the PlayStation 5 dev kit. But you can start messing about with everything. You can use um, other tools than you know, Microsoft Word. You can use uh, 3D software. You can use um, game engines and, uh, and everything that's around you. But they also know that, especially Chavda, it's, it's an academia, it's academic studies. After a while, that doesn't matter as much, but it's all you have now. It's all I had as well. So when you're new, you're probably going to be leaning a lot on the theories that you've read about, the analysis, analysis, analysis uh, that you've uh, read about. I don't know if people are still reading like Richard Bartle. It counts, because as a new guy, a new person, you, you need to have something to say, I think we should be doing this, because your gut feel isn't going to be worth much at a AAA studio when you're new. So you do need to, to accept and learn as much as you can with academia, but throughout your career, you're going to be leaning less and less on it, because your gut feel and your opinions and your own experience will carry more weight. But academia is actually one of the few things where you can really deliver and hopefully over-deliver and uh, beat you know, some of the already working people saying, well, you know, according to this, especially uh, cognitive psychology, HCI, and all that stuff, which is super the theoretical, but it does have a place. And on the craft, you need to apply yourself. You need to be working hard. Back in my day, again, we didn't have game engines. Uh, Shavda told us to use Ogre 3D. It's the best engine around. Turns out it's not even a game engine. It was a renderer. Um, you should be working hard on your craft. And I don't know if you want to be a pure game designer, a level designer, a narrative designer, or whatever kind of designer you want to be but you should be doing it as much as you can and learn as much as you can. And this is pretty obvious. A lot of the things I'll be talking about are pretty obvious, but I do think it can be pretty good to hear someone say it. And then if you ever find an argument, you can always say, well, he said it, this is how it works. There is no excuse today to not be the complete package. Um, all the resources are available online. Back in my day, again, tutorials were in text. Now they are on video. Now you monkey see, monkey do. Go on YouTube, learn how to do effing everything. Use, um, oh sorry, yeah, uh, also learn art. Use all the, the engines. 
you should be able to basically handle every aspect of making a game. You don't need to be good at it, you don't need to be the best at it, but you need to understand it because everything is there. The tools are free. You have Blender for, for art, you have Unreal Engine, Unity, Game Maker, Godot, all of this cool stuff. There is literally no excuse. I would never hire a designer today that doesn't know how to do anything. Because, no, I just want to be a designer, and I just want to tweak numbers in someone else's game. You should be a pretty crafty person. I want a, I want a MacGyver. And on your portfolio, you de do need to have something. It's, uh, it's tough. You, know, you, you won't be able to point to a bunch of games you've made outside of, for example, school. But you do need to have something to show for, uh, for your worth. You can't just say, oh, but I'm really good, I'm really promising, or I'm a really hard worker, or I'm a, I'm a team player. Of course you are, everyone are. And a big part of this, which I think a lot of people are kind of messing up on, is bring what you're doing to a presentable level. Um, it's very easy to start things. It's very fun to experiment it doesn't really prove much because that's the easy part. I would much rather see something smaller that you brought to as high a quality bar as you can. And don't be a snob when it comes to tools. Now, I am a super strong proponent of Unreal Engine. I've been trained in Unreal Engine. I've released game with Unreal Engines. I will never leave Unreal Engine. But use Unity, use Game Maker, use whatever you want, use whatever 3D software you want to, to use. That's perfectly fine. Uh, no one really cares how you got there. And lastly, and this one I think is gonna hurt some people, and some people will just laugh, but charisma as a whole can be trained. We all have personalities. Okay, most of us have personalities, and those that don't need to get one. Um, just as with crafts, personality and charisma can be trained. Uh, you can go to something as cliche as a, a, a YouTube series called Charisma on Command. You read books on dating, and you apply that to normal conversations. You just hang out with people. But you need to figure out what basically your flaws are and work on it. And this is not something you can fix. And I think it's very important to remember that you can work on yourself without losing yourself. You will always be you and you should always be you and you should never try to be someone else. But if you know you have a tendency to annoy people because you do X, Y, or Z, maybe try to bring that back a bit. If you do know that you have a tendency to take over a room and it annoys people, try to do that less. Just work on yourself. I'm, I'm not going to present a persona of this is the person you should be, this is the person I'm looking to hire, this is the kind of person that always gets hired. Just be aware of yourself, know where your strength lies and know where your weakness lies and try to work on it. And I think just admitting that to yourself, you don't need to, to tell everyone around, it's like, you know, I'm actually really this. It's a big step on the way. And I think this is something that I've seen change a lot over time as well with people overall, that people are more okay to talk about personal development. And you want to make people want to work with you. And this obviously goes from your interview for your first job, because you want the employer to want to work with you, hence give you a job offer and bring you in. And then for the career as well, you want to be the person that people want to bring into their teams, to bring into getting something done. You want to be a lovable character. That does not mean you have to go hug people, give them cookies. It just means to, needs to be, you need to give something to the conversation. You need to add something to the energy. You don't want to be that vampire. So let's, let's see how we, we're going to get you that first job offer. And let's assume there is one. So to apply, you get one chance. People will look at your email once. It is worth that extra effort of writing a customized email. And I know I've been there. That like, look, it's, it's pretty boring. You, you have a list of 20 studios. You're going to apply to all of them. I, I better write a template and I'll replace the, the company name. It works, but it's after you've seen a, roughly a gazillion applications, you start seeing how they're written. And knowing that you put in the effort, 
it gives you that little extra notch against the people who didn't. Because remember, it's always kind of a competition. And you need to spell check and you need to sort your shit because it's really insulting when you don't. Especially for a designer which will be handling documentation and communication. I need to know that I can trust you to write and type and be organized. I've had applications saying company name here. It's like he didn't even try and he did not get the job. It really does happen. Show me that you're organized. Show me that you can create a good looking and very readable CV. Show me in the cover letter that you care about communication. And if you find it hard, that's fine. Ask for help. Not me, not the person you're applying for, but just get some help. Admit it. Just admit that it's an important factor of applying for a job. This is one of the worst ones when getting a, a job application for a junior position. How do you know that? You don't know my team. You don't know how we work. It's usually, oh, I've seen your games and I read an article and it seems that you work really hard. That's great. I also work really hard. And it's, it's, it's one of those, oh, I'll, I'll tell them what they want to hear. And I'm sure that a lot of people think that they will be a great addition. If you're going to make that statement, because it's, it's, it's optimistic, it's good. You better follow up with several sentences of why, because usually it's whatever you're doing, I align and we're going to be terrific together. If you're going to claim to work great in the team you're applying for, you need to say why. And most people do not. I don't know why I keep walking out here when I have to go back to the... So with your CV and with your portfolio, for a designer, I'd much rather see features you worked on over games. The classical thing is uh, I worked on these uh, school projects or you know, I was in this indie team or I was in this game jam and we made this game. And it might be um, a, a terrific game, not going not gonna to dismiss that at all, but I need to know who you are and I need to know what you're making. And you will not come to a AAA studio to make an entire game or to make 25% of a game. I would much rather see you having built a feature in, for example, Unreal Engine. One of the strongest applications I got for um, a guy who had applied for an internship and got it was that he'd made a um, wall climbing and ledge climbing system in Unreal. It's like, okay, he, he, he shows technical prowess. It had no art, you know, it, just uh, the stuff you get with the engine. Uh, technical prowess, and he brought it to something that you could play. This is much more similar to what you probably will be doing at a workplace. You will not be a product owner or even, even a feature owner, to be honest, but you will be working on more specific things, so it's much more relevant to show. You having been part of a cool project from school doesn't impress me because I don't know what that means. And be very careful with what you claim. Um, we had a guy, this wasn't even our uh, first job, but we had a guy apply for a design position at one of the AAA studios I worked at. And his CV was, it was pretty impressive. He'd worked on a lot of games and he had pitching experience. And he got uh, an interview. And the thing you do at an interview is you ask about the things on the CV. So he claimed to have worked on Dead Space 2. Terrific game. Great. What did you do? Well, I was working in a QA team in a different studio. He worked remote for two weeks on QA on a uh, Dead Zone 2, no, sorry, Dead Space 2 deadline. And that was off the project. That doesn't really count as a bullet point on your CV. He also had great pitching experience. I said, great, what have you pitched? It's like, no, I've brought forward a bunch of my ideas in the studio. Mm -hmm. Did anything manifest from any of those? No, no, but I'm really used to it. It's like, great, you keep trying. Pitching experience means for me that you've actually you know, done a proper pitch, maybe not necessarily been in a team, but something came of it, or it was a, a, a task assigned to you, or someone at least reviewed it. You literally just showed your ideas to your boss. 
That's not pitching experience on your CV. I will question you on everything on your CV, so just make sure that you have a good answer. Let's say you get the interview. Congratulations. Relax. The fact that you got the interview means that we're already interested. You don't have to do the opener. You're already on a date. However, don't get too relaxed. Be professional, respect the environment. We're not, I'm not going to say we're not buddies. Uh, it, it's not a hostile environment. And some people are better than others at reading the room. And you, you should definitely joke if you're a joker. You should definitely be charming if you're charming. You know, again, be yourself. But show the interview, the interviewer and the room enough respect that you're grateful to be there and that you're hoping to build something beautiful together. And again, this seems obvious, but then why are so many people effing it up so badly? And don't confuse confidence with cocky. Everyone loves confidence. We want to hire people that we feel this person can, can carry and own the responsibility. But we don't want that attitude, right? And some people just have a cocky nature, um, me included. Let's, let's hold it back a bit, at least during the interview. And again, don't overestimate your experience. This goes for a lot of students. I am so very, very guilty of this, so I'm not at, at all presenting myself as a poster child, but we really want to say that, oh, we have experience with this, and I've handled bugs, and I've used this software, and I've released games, and I was in this competition. It's usually not worth that much. List it, absolutely, but, but, but don't present it as that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And also, again, something people just don't want to admit. When you're presenting yourself, your clothes matter. Again, not telling you to dress in a certain way, not telling you that t-shirts aren't okay, not telling you to wear a suit. I am telling you to, you know, wear clothes that aren't, uh, you know, ruined or worn out. Everything is about selling yourself, uh, you know, at least wash them, you know. Um, it's, it's a first impression. It does count. People do get a, a very quick, assessment of you by seeing you. And this goes for grooming as well. Again, I don't care if you have a beard or if you have long hair, but just be mindful of how you present yourself and know how you present yourself. And I think with that, you can, you can uh, get you know, an extra little, a, a little um, step up. And also, of course, different studios work differently. I mean, some studios are known for being a bit more uh, bureaucratic and proper, and some are really laid back. That's fantastic. If you, if you're, if you feel confident enough to, to match that, go for it. But just be mindful. Don't, don't say, oh, no, I'll, 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 um, I'll dress however I want. Yes, of course, but you're going to have to face the consequences. That style might be just right, but it might just be something that the other end doesn't appreciate. Same thing with posture and body language. You know, a lot of us slouch. Not again, saying they shouldn't, but be mindful of what you're doing. A straight back often helps. I'm not telling you to take command of the room, but be mindful of what you're, how you're sitting, how you're standing, if you're fidgeting, what you're doing. We're back to the charisma and personality training. Just be mindful of how you're presenting yourself, because in the interview, you are selling yourself, you are the product. And if you're going to sell a piece of item, you would try and present it as nice as possible, you would clean it, you would present it in a good light. Please do the same with yourself. And with that also comes the new age of uh, wireless everything and working from home. Invest in a webcam, invest in a microphone. It does not have to be the expensive stuff at all. But it's really annoying having an interview where the audio is crap, uh, the video is grainy. Uh, you can't do much about your connection. But just the, what I see on the screen is the presentation of you. And it's very well worth investing in a 200 crown webcam if your uh, laptop webcam is crap. I'm telling you, it will come back as a reward to you. So let's figure out how to get hired. 
Let's see. Do you meet actual criteria? Great. Are you better than the person next to you? Great. You might have a chance. If not, you might have a rocky road. Because networking and knowing people will help. Who you know will help. Is that person willing to help you? Will help a lot. I've used this as well. You know, you have friends that work somewhere. They make sure that uh, the bosses actually look at your CV. Um, even even with Neon Giant, which is a very small studio, um, we we get more applications than we can answer, and we're at capacity at what we can even look at. So having someone being able to go, <coughs> it's. Uh, it's pretty useful, and that's something we don't like. Of course, every CV should get the same attention, of course, everyone should get the same chance. It's not the truth. That's not how it works. So let's see what we can do. You got the job. Fantastic. Some of this might be cynical, um, but you choose how you, how you play your career. You got a job. You want to keep your job. You might want a better job in the future. You want a career. Again, traditional AAA. So let's look at salary negotiations. Um, how much money will you make? One thing I haven't really seen in talks is actual salaries mentioned. So I figure I'll just basically list my salaries through my career, and you can make what, what you will of that. Back in th 2008, I got my first job. I got 19,000 crowns. Um, with today's uh, inflation, that's about 22,000 crowns. My next job, uh, I got a raise to 28,000 crowns. I went from 19 to 28. And my last job as a senior designer, I was making around 45,000 a month. Design has a tendency to start out pretty low, and it has the potential of going basically however high, um, well, of course, however high the studio is willing to pay, but it, it has a pretty, pretty significant uprate towards the end. Um, different studios, different salaries, of course, um, but I would not expect huge salaries in the first, at least the first five years. It's, it's from what I've seen. Uh, and also on, the, the, on uh, your worth mention is that a lot of people say, but I'm worth this, I'm worth this. No, you're always worth exactly what you're getting paid for, uh, or w exactly what you're getting paid. Just like hockey players shouldn't be making that much money, well, they're worth that much money because that's how much money they bring in. Uh, the workplace set your worth, and either you accept it, and that's how much you're worth, or you don't, and you figure it out somewhere else, and you change your value. But it's not really a worthwhile discussion to say, Oh, but I'm worth more, unless you're willing to, to act on that. It is much, much easier to negotiate on benefits than this, your actual salary. Because benefits are usually tax deductible. Um, so maybe you can get a parking spot. Maybe they can pay for your uh, train travel car that you need for commuting. There's a lot of things that companies can do if they really want to meet you, but they can't uh, fiddle with salary too much. Some companies are locked with salary, saying like, hey, we, we have this salary, uh, sorry, we have this position approved, but only within the salary bracket, so we can't offer you more. And then it's going to be very hard to convince uh, your potential boss of going to his bosses or owners or publisher or whatever and ask for a bigger budget. It's just very unlikely when there might be a candidate next to you that's um, just as good. And I would argue that the only real way to get a raise is by being willing to do something if you're not getting it. Doing something means leaving. You can say, I think I, earn more, I, think I deserve more money. Some workplaces will say, you know what, you're right. Uh, it's about time we adjusted that. Fantastic, it happens, it has happened, it's, it's, it's good. Usually it is, okay, I'll take that into consideration, good to know, we're doing a salary review every spring, or whatever the system is. If you're saying, I need more, or I'll be going to this place, or I'll be going somewhere else because I've, I've heard that I can be making 5,000 more. Now you have some, some negotiations to do, but you need to be willing 
to move ahead because if you ever say I'm not making enough if I don't get more I'm leaving and they say then they'll say well you're not getting more it's like guys ah, fine I'll stay you you lost your power really you did um, so leaving uh, being willing to leave is is uh, very very necessary also of course leaving every time you change job you should get a salary increase because it's the best moment for you to increase it you can increase it quite a lot um, can't really give you numbers there because I don't know them but uh, significantly more than if you stay at the same company and that's something I really don't like with the industry as it is because I think we should be rewarding the loyal people that sticks around but you will see that the most people that have really high salaries are the people that have had a lot of different jobs and you know they went up between let's say f two and five thousand every time and then you know you see them having salaries at 60, 70,000 without even having a management or lead position. And that's up to you. I think it's a shame, but that's how it works. Also remember, your salary is not what you cost the company. You cost much, much more. So this goes back to benefits. If you feel a bit bitter and you say, it's like, I only asked for another thousand crowns. Like, no, you didn't. Yes, for several thousand crowns more on the cost end of the company. And that's the only thing the company can look at. So you need to be mindful of that. And I think the best advice I can give you is to try and look at everything from the company or your boss's perspective, because then you will have an easier time navigating that conversation. And there are only two reasons to hire designers. And I will tell you already that one of them is not because we don't know what game to do next. And I have received several emails saying, I have this idea, I'll let you do it. Or I have this idea and I would only need to play a small part. Admittedly, usually from non-game devs, usually fans. And it's, it's great that, I mean, it's a compliment to say, hey, oh, I love Neon Giants games. I would be really happy if you made my idea next. That is not the problem. That's not what we need help with. Any company that hires a designer hires it because they need new skills to the studio. We are going to move into free to play and we need someone who understands monetization or player retention. We haven't done that before. We need to bring in that skill set. Um, people that do not yet have a job are very unlikely to bring in that skill set. Um, I would not trust someone who haven't done the job before to do it their first time around here if we're looking for a new skill set. The other thing we're looking for is someone to do the things we don't want to or we can't because we don't have enough time. That will be the job you are looking for. And that's what's very important to understand with what the designer does. A designer does not do the things artists do. A designer does not do the things a programmer do. A designer does not do the thing audio, audio people do, etc., etc., etc. What's left is what the designers do. So a designer might be put on setting up assets for a dialogue, setting up individual uh, files that are just needed to create uh, armor for an RPG. It's not always glamorous. It's, it's the getting stuff done right. There's also the fun part of balancing the game and collecting data, but it's very much of just getting things done that other disciplines are not handling. And again, this will change as you have a career and you can you know, bring more to the table and your, your word carries more weight. But let's be clear that it's very much just doing stuff work. And a lot of people will claim that they can design. And the thing is that everyone can. Everyone will think that they can do your job so they will not love having you around. And this is where it's extra important that you're a delight to have around. Um, because it, for a lot of people, a lot of other disciplines, it, it's often annoying that designers walk around and deciding things when they're not even making the game. It's changing a lot, especially thanks to technology, so designers can be more hands-on. Uh, but this was very much a thing for a very long time. So you really need to earn the respect by, by basically being good. 
So try and make their lives easier. Try and help out where you can, be that setting up assets, uh, collecting data, facilitating, you want to be a benefit for the team and you want as many people around you as possible to see that you are a benefit to the team. So if everyone can design, your job is to be better at it. And let's be clear that being a designer does not mean that you're the boss of anything. Even if you're a designer in FPS, it doesn't mean that you're going to be deciding how the guns work. Probably some other designer is going to be that. Uh, something that I saw when I was a student was that there was this assumption that designers decided what the game was and they, they set up the rules and then it was up to the artists and programmers to go make that game until the designers could come on board later and then start fiddling with some numbers and say I made a design. That's not how it works. So don't expect to be a leader, just help sorting things out. Some studios have p producers that do what a lot of us call design. Uh, some studios have designers that do a lot of what people call production. For me, they're two very different things, but that would be a talk on its own. But try and just help things be as smooth as possible where you can. That's your best path. And then we have the big bad of the industry, of every industry, and everyone hates it, and that is nepotism. And while we can debate, not whether, but how bad it is, it exists. Accept it, use it if you're okay with that, but don't put your head in the sand and pretend that it's not a thing. When you're networking and when you're trying to get people's emails and when you do want someone to, hey, please have a look at my CV, I'll send it in tomorrow, you're, you're, you're asking for favors, you're asking for special treatment. You're, you're not in any way asking to be treated the same as everyone else because you also know that someone else is looking for the same job as you. Be mindful that it accepts, uh, that it uh, exists accept it, and you can call it whatever you want, but sucking up will always be a method in every industry ever. Showing off and showing off your, your expertise, your skills, will always be a thing. Use it, do it, embrace it. And the reason we hire people we know or people that come with references is because we, as employers, want to take as little risk as possible with employees. So if I hire someone for the third time, it means that I know how this person works and I know what I'm getting instead of a potential loose cannon or a bomb. And with that, you need to be playing the social long game. So with that, you need to remember that people that you talk to today might be very useful, if I'm allowed to use that word, but they, it might be very beneficial for you in many, many years. I today work with people I studied with. Um, they went off and had different careers, and then, you know, 15 years later, we're working together because I still know how that person is. I remember how that person ticked during the studies. I felt comfortable bringing those people in, and it's worked wonders. And this one, I know, is going to look bad, but in school or in your uh, environment, try to surround yourself with people that you think are going to make it. Now, of course, be a good friend, be a good person, be, be friendly with everyone, but I can say that from my student days, my my friend clique, most of them got a job and careers, and people that, you know, in general, people didn't expect much of, they didn't. And I have seen people get into the industry, dropping out of the industry, I've seen people get into the industry, staying in the industry, and I can only remember one person from school who got into the industry many, many years later. And he is awesome, so all creds, but it's very rare. So you will see pretty early 
on where you can hitch a ride socially and career-wise. Like, oh yeah, no, I know people at that place. That was a classmate of mine. No, no, we still keep in touch. Keep in touch. Don't be sleazy, don't be weird, don't be creepy. But send an email once a year. Hey, just check in, how you're doing? Nothing weird with that. But again, be a decent person. I know I'm painting a bleak picture of psychopaths and sociopaths hanging around. That's not what I'm asking for. But try to cast a wide net. So prime people to do this with. When you remember, you already have a job. We're working on your career now. Are visitors. Because often, very large studios will fly people over. It's like, oh shit, we have a deadline. It's okay, we'll send people from our LA office. Aha! Prime people. Um, the reason they are being sent over is probably because they're good and they're problem solvers. And they're also very lonely. They don't know anyone there. Take them out for dinner, take them out for lunch, be there, become friends. Genuine friendship can happen, I promise you. One of my best friends today is <laughs> such a person, and we've been friends for over 10 years, and we still work together on every single project because he's uh, contracting, so I bring him in to everything. Uh, and he also gets me assignments and we're helping each other out. They are um, very open to, to networking. And since they're already being sent around, it means that they're not complete garbage. Also new staff. You will be new staff, so, you know, I, I hope you all get friends. Um, but uh, if you're working somewhere and they hire even newer people, welcome them again have lunch with them, see if you can help them, talk to them. You know, you know how lost you are when you're in a new environment, you start school, whatever it is. It's the same in a career. I still, if I change job after 15 years of doing this, you're still a bit lost early on. So you're, you're looking for people to attach to. Be that person, because that person was good enough to get hired, perfect, and might have a very, very, very strong career ahead of uh, themselves. So just be there for people. Also, this one I didn't fade. Just remember that reputation plays a big part in this. Uh, it's a small word and people talk. I, I hear things about people in the US, people in Canada, and you'd be surprised. My, uh, my prime example of this, and I can't see if maybe someone here will know, know the story, but um, there's a guy in the industry with a pretty foul reputation, and I was traveling to Malmö and met people I've never met before and uh, he brought up a name. I was like, oh yeah, I, I know the guy, I used to work with him. It's like, I've actually seen a video of him, a girl breaking his arm. He was trying to impress on something which went wrong, you can hear the pop in the video. And they laughed their asses off, like, thank God, I hate that guy. It's like, well, I'm, I'm in Malmö, I've never met you. I, I didn't know you knew this person. This guy is such a bad rap, everyone, everyone in Sweden knows, because bad news spread very quickly. Don't be a bad guy, because it will haunt you, and it will be very hard to, to clean up that stain. Um, so be, be very, very mindful of that. Don't be afraid, but be mindful. And lastly, as someone who is hiring, and I've seen a lot of CVs, don't, don't, and I know, I know there are people in here doing this, stop doing this. I hate it. Everyone hates them. They mean nothing. What does any of this mean? If I get a full bar on Unreal Engine, I expect you to make the entire effing game yourself. If you're 10 out of 10 in Swedish, I want you to be better than me and be able to write books. This means absolutely nothing. Please list the programs you're comfortable with, list your skills, but don't measure them like this. It's, it's dumb. I'm serious. It's remove it. And I'm not the only one. I might feel stronger than a lot of people, but I've talked to a lot of people, and we all hate it. So either you accept this, or you get into the industry and you change it. But this is how I've seen the industry, and this is how I still see the industry. And this is how, to a large part, I've navigated the industry, and I still have a job. So thank you.
frågor? Ja, yeah, please. So if you have any questions, uh, then you have to walk up here to the middle aisle uh, and ask them into the microphone. If you are watching the stream, you have to go on Discord and ask your questions there. Are there any questions? I'm sure there are questions. Come on, don't be shy. There's a question. Yes, hello. Thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was also wondering, because I know that schools, they don't really focus a lot on, um, you know, this process of getting a job and maintaining your career. So, mm. like, how do you see schools maybe adding this into their curriculum of, like, making sure that people actually get out into the industry and know how to do an interview, know how to build their career and that kind of stuff? I think with almost anything as specialized as this, uh, they should be bringing in more people from the actual industry uh, and um, basically ask a question or have someone talk about it. Because I do believe, I mean, I try to summarize 15 years, but uh, I do believe that stuff like this changes. I don't know who's teaching nowadays, but uh, I was very fortunate that uh, when this, uh, when uh, DSU was new, uh, they brought in um, like Ola Holmdahl, uh, lead on Battlefield 1942. Uh, they brought in Jon Sulte, and who was writing game engines for PSP. Like very, very relevant people. And what I've seen um, happening with game devs, and this is not to to diss uh, on on any game dev school list, but there's a lot of students now teaching, and they haven't done it themselves. They never got the job, so how are they going to teach you? Then just be humble and bring someone in who knew either someone who is in a position to hire and say, well, this is what I'm looking for, or uh, bring someone in who's, you know, maybe jumped and gotten a lot of jobs and you say, like, this is how I did it. All right, thanks. Sure. What other questions do you have? This is your chance. Right? So, you mentioned earlier about how to write uh, job application emails and that you don't want to have the standard, you know, uh, script or form and, and such like that. And many years ago, I know that the late Total Biscuit um, made a, like a video about uh, someone who presented a game to him through an email, but since he get a lot of them, uh, most of them just, you know, pass on by because it's the same thing. Hey, I made a game, play it. And what this guy did was he uh, just started the entire email with like a meme gif. I is there something like that that you could do to like actually get a job or would that just be like obnoxious and weird? No, I, I, I mean, okay, I might be opening up for a lot of weird emails, but no, I, I think stuff like that works. Uh, and you'd be, you'd be surprised at um, emails at a very high corporate level as well being, you know, pretty silly because it, it's, it's still people. Whatever you can do to catch the attention, right? Um, but just don't come off as a fool. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of memes to choose from, so pick, pick choose, uh, choose wisely. Um, but yeah, basically anything to get the, the hook in, right? And there's nothing wrong with, with the template, but the template usually has... Um, Start with uh, two sentences about who you are and then tell the company why they want to hire you and not why you want to work there because of course you do, you're already applying. The template is fine, just make sure it's interesting and also fewer words are usually better. Um, some people are very keen on explaining but just get me interested and then we'll take it from there. Looks like we have another question. So I have a question regarding, uh, hopefully a rather quick question regarding design. Uh -oh. From listen, I show you it's quite quick. Uh, from listening to you, you made designing as a as a job sound rather one-dimensional. Would you say this is the case? And if so, do you have any quick tips on how to get around this? No, I'm, I'm, I was probably presenting it in an overly bitter way, but it's also because I want to kill some of the passion and expectations. Um, more than anything, I think I know a lot of designers who's just getting 
crap because you're not going to be automatically liked as a designer. You need you really need to work on it. And I think that a lot of people make the mistake on that they might be coming in too hard, too fast as designers on a workplace. And it might be best to you know keep your head down for a couple of years, and be, like until you kind of figure yourself out. The game is amazing. And there's a reason I still do it. Uh, the game. Uh, the um, the job is amazing, and there's a reason I still do it. Uh, but it will take some time before you get to do the fun stuff, and you should be very well prepared to do the not so fun stuff in the beginning. And again, this is traditional AAA. I totally understand that indie is completely different, and everyone has a say, and everyone is a designer, and everything is fantastic. But if you're going to be working in, let's say, a design team of five people at a big studio, you're not going to get all the fun stuff because the people already there are going to be doing that. That's all I want to like really drive home. That it's not going to be glamorous at first, but it's well worth it because what you want a designer job to be, it can be if you make it that. It can be you that's owning the weapons because someone's going to have to. It can be you working with the AI program because someone's going to have to. It's just not going to be day one and just ease into it. Right. Thank you. Excellent answers. That's unfortunately all the time that we have. Um, you're probably going to be around, though. So yeah, I'll be around uh, all questions. day. I'm going to grab something to eat, but after that, just come up and poke me and call me out on my bullshit. <laughs> Excellent. Another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to have another quick break here on the main stage, and then we're going to be back at 1 o'clock and talk about audio. So uh, please come back then.